September 14th, 2021. Uh, please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Upcoming meeting dates for the Planning Board are October 12th, 2021 and November 16th, 2021. We have minutes uh, for August 17th and August 24th. Has the rest of the board had a chance to review those? I did not have a chance. Uh, they just came out lately, so we'll hold those until the next meeting. Uh, so we'll start with the roll call. Richard Campbell. Lori T. John Eichmann. Ed May Ocean. Sarah Bledsoe. A uh, little announcement about um, face masks. If you're not vaccinated, we ask that you wear a face mask except when speaking at the podium. And if you are vaccinated, you're free to go ahead and wear a face mask anyway, as many of us are. The State Farm application will be moved up on the agenda for tonight. We'll actually move that to just after the uh, two extensions of minor subdivisions. And I do want to make an announcement that there will be a joint public hearing between the town board and the planning board of the town of East Fishkill on the 23rd day of September 2021 at 6 p.m. right here in town hall. Uh, and that application is for the rolling Frito-Lay sales LP for the granting of site plan and subdivision approval by the planning board and economic redevelopment special permit approval by the town board. And we will hear more about that application later on in the agenda. So the first item on the agenda is Hopewell Enterprises, LLC. Michael Gillespie. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. So uh, approximately six months ago, just shy of, we were before this board relative to a, a six lot residential subdivision and a lot line alteration with the adjoining property, Sabellico. Um, I guess there's two reasons why we're asking for the extension. Um, we are waiting on a last test result uh, of one of our test wells um, to make sure we're uh, in good shape relative to a, a radon issue. Uh, number two is the client's council has been working with the town attorney relative to some of the shared driveway easements and, and things such as that. I think we're getting close, so I've been told. So uh, we were just wanted a little more time to allow that to happen, and then we can go ahead and, and get uh, the final subdivision done and filed, so. So I think I've noticed you're asking for two six-month extensions? Uh, usually it's two, three-month extensions, right? Good question. I'll uh, take two, six months if you got it, but I, I think it's- But you, do you just need six months? Yeah, I, I don't, I think that's all we can ask for. Okay. So if we extend it out six months, that would be with the uh, expiration March. date- March. Of March, March 31, 2022. Okay, that works wonderful. Could I have a motion to extend I just, that? I just had a question though. Sorry. I remember when, Originally, you had asked uh, permission to clear the lots, which the planning board granted, so there was, seemed to be a big rush. So if you could just, how did we get from that to this? How did we get from that to this? Well, you wanted to hurry up and, and clear the trees, but as it turns out, you did all that clearing and it wasn't necessary because you're still not ready to get Well, your, there's still a bad issue, right? So there's still a bad issue right now. We yeah, can't but at the end of October, you're not gonna be approved, so you didn't really gain much. Well, we weren't anticipating this was going to take this long, so we are now asking for two, three. I mean, it's maybe something the board should consider in the future about granting permission to clear. I don't, I don't know what that hurt, but yeah, I, I, I guess yeah. We did ask for permission to clear because of the the uh, Indiana bat issue. Obviously, that's been done, so um, I don't particularly know if there were any issues related to that related to the town, but. Um, we're looking for two additional extensions to allow for these final items to be taken care of. Any so other? Indifferent of the, the paperwork. So it says, it says two six month extensions. So he's looking for a single six month extension or two three month. Two. I, 
He's looking for two. I see months. those as equal. Are, is that the same thing? Michelle? I'm sorry, I missed what your question was. So two three-month extensions are the same as one six-month extension? Basically, but I think they're only allowed to grant three months at a time, three months at a time. Once, once a time, at a time? I'm so sorry. No, no, you're only allowed to, you're only allowed to do it three months three at, month in three-month intervals. intervals. So. It's, it's in three-month intervals per New York State town law. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking to make it a little bit simpler. <laughs> so we'll do two three-month extensions. Correct. To March 31st. Sure. 2022. Additional questions or comments? Anything from any of the other professionals? Okay, could I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Zeller Minor Subdivision. And here again, you're looking for extensions. Let us know where you stand and. Yeah, so we're. we're through the health department as well, uh, as mentioned, we did ask for trees to be cut on that uh, lot as well, but we also didn't anticipate it was going to take four months to get a well driller out there to drop the well. So that's that's the issue with this particular project. So we're asking for more time to allow that to happen, do the testing, and, and wrap it up. So from what I see here, this, uh, the, the expired, the, the old extension? Yeah, we're looking, this one kind of slipped by us. We're looking for a retroactive extension. We're not asking for any more than a total year, but it would go back to the point that it was approved at the end of that six months and then follow ahead. Any questions or comments from the professional? I think it's just the same thing. You know, we just have to be mindful with these permission to clear when the project drags on. Got it. Again, I, I, I don't know how I can control, you know, the well driller to get in there, so it's... Well, it's just typically you wouldn't grant that until you had all your approvals. That's, that's all I'm saying, so. Okay, so for the Zeller Minor Subdivision, we're looking for two three-month extensions that would take us to January 19th, 2022. Right. Could I have a motion for that? So moved. Thank you, Laurie. Second. Ed, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Curious. Right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is montage. Uh, I thought you were going to state oh, farm. I'm sorry. Excuse me. My apologies. I announced early on that I was going to go to State Farm, and then I failed to do what I had to announce. So the next item on the agenda is State I, Farm. I thought that's what you said, but I wasn't sure with the mask. I can't. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. How you doing? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I was just looking to uh, put a shed on replacing a 12, there was a 12 by 10 plastic shed on commercial property that I purchased. And in that area, I was just going to replace it with a steel shed that has a garage door opening so I can park my car in there in the wintertime. <laughs> so you said the existing shed? It was an existing, uh, one of those plastic sheds. It was a 12 by 10 that was back there that uh, the prior owners used for just storing his uh, car cleaning stuff. He has a, a limo business had there. Is it is it on a foundation? That whole it? area that you're looking at is all asphalt and it's actually just been resealed and all relined. So I had everything redone, but it's in mint condition. It was on the uh, plastic shed was on asphalt as well before, but those things come with a little floor. This actually goes right on it, so you can drive in. It's just uh, mounted right to the asphalt. I just I just like to comment. I don't think you have your handicap signs up. You've got to take a look where you have. You may have had everything restriped, but I don't think you have a handicap. Yeah, no, nope, they put new handicap in there. The yeah, old one was worn. Okay. Yep, I, okay. that was the first thing I wanted to make sure okay. they had on there. Okay, There's uh, two handicap spots and the ramp. Everything's Good. up to code. Good. Yeah, the other one was worn. <laughs> that was one of the reasons why I might as well seal coat it and yeah, I still get it driving. I didn't see the sign. So yep, okay. right up front. Okay. And will this this shed you're calling will it have an actual door on the front of it? Uh, yeah, there's gonna there's a roll up garage door, the ones that just roll up and a walk in entrance off to the side. So if you just needed to, for any storage stuff in there, um, 
would be on the right hand side where the other to, to replace what the other shed did for storage and on the other side I could actually just pull in my small car I actually don't have a garage at my house and my poor car has been sitting out in the elements it's a little M class <laughs> Scott I defer to you just to try to understand the fact that if it's that size of a structure does it require to have a foundation or how is how are we going to look to make sure that it's secured to the ground it's in the engineering report too how they secure it's a metal structure yeah and, and uh, uh you know some of these have these soil anchors that you know i have correct. to submit it's going to have to submit to the building department that really is okay. a building department thing but mm. they do have uh these buildings sometimes set on asphalt carports or whatnot that have soil anchors through the asphalt so but that'll be a building they, department that's exactly they require that too and they require it to be level and they require it to be two feet from the building because they they have all their uh for access for them to get in and assemble and it has to be on a level ground for the structure so they're and i did send all the engineering reports from them too they're they're, <laughs> uh, they're pretty thorough when you buy something from them so and the height uh it's a uh typical eight uh, well it's nine nine foot and i'm not sure where the ceiling height is it's actually in there the dimensions that it goes up uh, I think the garage door itself is a typical nine foot garage door and then it's one foot above that and uh, the, it's not a very severe pitch but it's coming front to back so um, I don't want any snow or anything going side to side or by the building so so it's not a peak roof it's like a uh, no it's peak it's um it's peak but it turns turn uh, sideways yeah, just <coughs> Take a quick look. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, because you go down next to the building. in between that two foot area where the mm. building is to get it out. Right. So what, what's that going to look like from the road? Can't see it. Can't see it from the side either. Um, yes, sir. I don't know if we, we, where the front of that building is, it drops down. And then there's a big tree there that I actually just had trimmed because I was worried about it falling on my building. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's an old tulip tree that's been there, probably 200 years old. And they actually did that today, had an alpine tree come, make sure that it's safe, viable, and trim the daylights out of it because if it fell on anybody, my office is right up front. Mm, I wasn't happy with that. So... And from the side, you have bushes, and that's where the uh, Williams lumber is, and it drops down, and then those bushes come in. So there's really no view of it whatsoever. And I had it made. It's going to be the same color as the building with gray on the bottom because we're white with gray, and the roof is like a uh, almost a, a brick color, which we did. There's a new roof, which I had to go for a permit also uh, that I had done when I purchased the building. So it's going to match it. I'm pretty much into aesthetics, so. <laughs> uh, no, just from the, from that picture, it looks like it'd be visible from eight yeah, to no, two. And, but as long as there's you know bushes and yeah. trees in the way. I'd buy, come by, you know, come that, and see. <laughs> are the two parking spaces that it's replacing? Are they the ones that are shown on there that'll just not be striped? Those, yeah, those weren't even parking spaces. And in fact, where you see the the parking spaces in the back, they're not there anymore. They. They weren't necessary. I don't need that many parking spaces, A, and B, they're up against the building, which, you know, I'm not going to have a funeral there. You see enough of them across the street. <laughs> it's really sad, especially lately. Oh, my God. So I just had them stripe all the ones on the edge, and you see where the two handicaps are. Those were redone with the handicap signs and the blue handicap there. Those are actually gone. They've just been seal-coated over. So, and there was never anything there except for a shed in an area kind of was a little awkward to if you park something there you're just blocking some macadam so so if those if somebody parks in those last spaces are you essentially blocked in yeah but they're not spaces any longer that's what i'm saying those those they're not even striped. oh at the very end is not no okay. those, at the entire right. along the back there the only parking spaces i left were all the ones along the back fence and the ones along the side fence okay. it's more than sufficient parking for my team members and for clients, it's actually way more than enough. That's what it came with, though. So, <laughs> well, I guess there used to be sometimes up to 100 people in that building. Oh yeah. They also put 
they just put four splits in air conditioning units. Because if you have 100 people in there in suits in the summer to remove the heat, it's a lot. I put one split on 74. All my people are complaining they're cold, which I'm happy with because there's no electricity being used. <laughs> Any other questions or comments by board members or professionals? Okay, this is a minor site plan, so. Sorry to have more time. Michelle, knowing that this last of the spots aren't striped, I'm assuming it's still paved where the spots are that you removed? Yeah, I, I didn't change anything that way. So do we want to include that in the adjustment here to just note I think that we should, they could be returned should, to parking? Yeah, I think what we should probably just do is, what I can do is just note in the resolution the number of parking spaces that are actually out there. Okay. So I, I will ask you, Ken, maybe I'll, tomorrow, maybe I'll run over there and just count up the spaces. Yeah. There were 52 and I removed eight. Okay. For the lines anyway, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a minor site plan and so no public hearing is required. However, we do need to refer this to the Architectural Review Commission. Um, could I have a motion for that referral? Second. Second. So moved. <laughs> motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Excellent. So we do have a resolution for approving this. It'll be subject to the approval by the ARC and subject to the final count for parking that we just discussed. This is a resolution of amended site plan approval for State Farm Insurance. Whereas the above referenced applicant applied to the Town of East Fishkill Planning Board for an amended site plan approval to construct an 18 by 18 metal garage, whereas the proposed garage would be located to the rear of the office building on the existing paved parking area, whereas the garage would replace two existing parking spaces, whereas the site would still have sufficient parking capacity, whereas the action is considered a type two action under seeker and no further seeker review is required. Now therefore be it resolved that the Planning Board approves the amended site plan titled Map of Survey for the Lands of 900 Route 82, Town of East Fishkill, Dutchess County, New York, prepared by Robert V. Oswald, dated April 14th, 2021, and last revised through September 9th, 2021, with the following conditions. Number one, approval of shed from the Architectural Review Council. Be it further resolved that within five business days of the adoption of this resolution, the chair or other duly authorized member of the planning board shall cause a copy of this resolution to be filed with the town clerk and a copy sent to the applicant owner. And I just revised the whereas clause. I said, whereas the garage would replace two existing parking spaces for a total of 44 spaces on the site. Correct. Okay. And they'll inform me when the review's done or? They, they'll inform me when that's completed or? Uh, yes, you, yeah, yeah, you'll have to go through the, um, the application process. We'll, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow okay. and okay. walk you through that. Great, okay. got it. All right. Because yeah, the building so, department won't, won't issue a permit until that's all done as well. This, is, this came in just by way of ex explanation. This, he did not realize he had to get uh, site plan approval for the garage, so he went to the building department for a building permit and they referred him to the planning board, so we got him on this agenda as quickly as possible and that's why we, we normally would sort of try to simultaneously do the um, a ARC, but the ARC um, wasn't meeting until this, this month, so that's how it's working. Okay, thank you. So, could I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, have a great night. And now, back to, back to montage. If we could have a, a brief presentation, several of the board members I think are new and have not seen a previous presentation, so. Yes, thank you very, very much. Uh, my name is Richard O'Rourke. I'm a member of the firm of Keenan Bean PC, serving as counsel to Charbel uh, on this application. Here tonight with me is Mark Canoli, who's the Senior Vice President for Development at Charbel, and Amy Bombardieri, who's with State Storsker, our consulting engineer. Uh, by way of background, this project has gone through an exhaustive CICRA review and has been the subject of several public hearings. and. Um, along the way, there was a completion of a draft environmental impact statement, a final environmental impact statement, a supplemental final environmental impact statement. And through that evolution, 
uh, what has been developed is a, and the preferred alternative, is a cluster subdivision which will enable us to assist the town by, uh, we're going to be conveying two uh, water wells to the town system and also there will be uh, an effort that's ongoing presently and that is for this subdivision as well as Summit Woods to uh, have a formation of a special district uh, for the prov provision of, of sewer services. So what I thought might be best just by way of background, Mr. Canoli has been with the project through its uh, inception to give you sort of a bird's eye view of, of what we're doing, where we are, and what our next step is, which we believe is the scheduling of a public hearing on the application. So with that, may I turn it over to Mr. Canoli? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's what happens when you hire uh, great rep representation. They kind of steal the show. So uh, <laughs> as re was requested, I'll be brief. My name is Mark Canoli. I'm Senior Vice President of Development with Charbel Development Corp. We've been working in East Fishkill. I see some new faces. Um, we've been working in East Fishkill since 2004. We started this process. Uh, the, this is the Tucker Farm on Route 52, where it intersects with Route 216. The project is 385 acres on the south side of 52. Uh, we started the process with a proposal for a senior housing, non-senior hybrid. Worked with the town at that point, the town uh, 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 zoning and, and planning board decided not to proceed with, with that type of zoning, so we went forward with an as of right application, worked with the planning board at the time. Um, and through the course of several years, we got through, as Mr. O'Rourke uh, just mentioned, um, a supplemental finding statement and then eventually a, a finding statement. And here we are tonight uh, in uh, 2021, a few years later, a little more gray hair. Uh, a lot more has gone on. Um, but we're excited about where we are. Um, <clears throat> what we're doing now is we're working with Mr. Bryant on the off-site sewer um, analysis. We're working with our adjacent property owner at the Summit Woods property and combining our efforts to uh, support the town's study of the capacity of the Four Corners sewer treatment plant such that we can combine our sewer flow and direct our sewer up to Four Corners versus building a new regional um, water treatment plant, sewer, sewer treatment plant. Um, as was mentioned, we have two high yielding wells on the property that will serve our property as well as the Summit Woods project. And uh, it was also requested that we study those wells for, for both uh, water quality and capacity to see if we can tie those in to the town system as well as a backup system for Four Corners. Um, we believe at this point we have the engineering um, completed such that we are prepared for the, uh, if, if the board decides to proceed with an uh, October um, public hearing where we'll go into a little more depth uh, with the application. I, I think by that time we'll have some technical review memos that we may need to respond to. Um, we're also working with uh, outside agencies including the DOT uh, for the intersection of 216 and Route 52. For a few years we had contemplated what improvement we would do there. There's going to be a full realignment of that intersection. At this point, the, the state is, is, is opting for a traffic circle versus a signal. So that'll be a nice element there to calm the traffic, realign 216 with 52 and our new drive that will serve not only our property, but will connect all the way through, as you can see on the exhibit, three pods of development, and then eventually connect over to Summit Woods, and then through Summit Woods would connect back out to Route 52. So there's been talk of that master plan being constructed for several years, and this project brings that forward. Um, in addition to that, we recently submitted, um, we gave a package to the town, to the DEC for three um, wetland crossings that are at existing farm roads. We've worked with them for several years. We've done habitat studies. We've done everything that you can think of, cultural studies. And I believe we're very close uh, in getting those permits as well. And that would also include the water uh, withdrawal permit. So 
All of the outside agency uh, permits are pending. Um, we've been providing updates to the town. I, I believe the town has most of our correspondence that we've had with outside agencies. We continue to copy you on those. So we look forward to seeing you uh, in October and, and concluding the, the public hearing on the subdivision. Great, thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Brendan, about, uh, you know, I know um, traffic circles seem to be the uh, new, new wave here, but given the amount of tractor trailers that are going up that mountain and down 52, is that really a great place to have one of those? Um, I actually have not seen a plan for the roundabout yet. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a preliminary or conceptual plan that's been developed yet. Um, you know, there, there's certainly uh, modern roundabouts are capable of handling uh, tractor trailer traffic. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, yeah, coming of how up it's that laid long out. straight away, I'm not sure that they'd be slowed down enough for one of those without some, some other right. adjustments along the way. Yeah, I, I think that would absolutely be a concern about the uh, it be, the speeds being a little higher there uh, once you get past the Taconic and uh, being able to uh, uh, slow down and negotiate a, a, a roundabout. So I think that's, you know, an important aspect of that. Um, I, I know, we, you know, we also haven't really uh, been involved in any of the discussion with the DOT uh, or jointly with you guys. So that's something we should, uh, we should look to do uh, um, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, work on that. Uh, and coordinate with the DOT al along with along with that, because I think at one point in time it was proposed to be a signal. Yeah, Mr. Ryoshi, we'll, during the process of the seeker, we had contemplated a signal at that intersection. Some of those comments came up regarding traffic. You saw Route 52 has been recently reconstructed out there. It's a two lane, one lane in each direction. There is a plan. It's a draft plan that's been submitted. Um, both the signalized intersection. And, and the roundabout was submitted to DOT. They have opted to proceed and have us look in a direction of a, of a traffic circle versus a signalized intersection. I'll provide that, that plan. I, I thought we had given you a copy of that. I apologize. Yeah. That yeah. hasn't been submitted yet, but um, we'll give you a copy of that as well. Um, it's been in designed to accommodate, as you know, emergency services, fire trucks, uh, large tractor trailers. Um, in fact, lucky for us, the, the real estate needed for that circle, we also have uh, control of the northern uh, quadrant uh, owned by the Tucker family as well. So all of the land needed for the circle is land that we control. So there isn't going to be any condemnation. There would be some realignment of some driveways, um, but I think the benefit of that traffic circle is realigning 216 and a very dangerous intersection um, and having that traffic calming, you know, at the intersection of, of a new development. So, um, but we'll, we'll provide you with all of that um, in our, I guess we can do that by the 28th. I think that was uh, a good one. mentioned to DOT about our uh, discussion of providing uh, access to the rail trail from this community, about having some type of crossing on You know, sir, Brian, I haven't had that opportunity yet, but I did see that trailhead right there. I don't see why that would be something we Just couldn't to be do. Yeah. In that it's a, it's a very good point. Um, why don't we do, we'll send you the draft plan. I would hope that by before next meeting, we would get some comments that we could formally address and be ready to, to discuss those. And if, you know, if we have the time, even maybe meet offline before the meeting, hash out a few of those details, but we'll bring that up with them as well. In addition, if there's anything uh, related uh, to any of the coordination with DOT, whether it be letters or emails or their reviews, uh, please provide that also. Any other questions or comments? If not, as Mr. O'Rourke alluded to, uh, I think we're ready to schedule a public hearing. And our next meeting is on October 12th, 2021. Um, so if that works for you, we can schedule you for that day. Absolutely. Could I have a motion to schedule a public hearing for montage on October 12th, 2021? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank I'll you. See you in October. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay. The next 
Item on the agenda is uh, Stormville Square. What's going on? Good evening. How are you guys? Great. Brian Stokosa, Day and Stokosa Engineering. Um, here tonight for the uh, Stormville Square site plan application. Um, parcels located at the intersection of 216, Old Route 52. Two parcels right now. Uh, one existing parcel is vacant. Um, second parcel to the north um, contains a small retail building. Parking in the front um, with some parking in the rear. Refuse enclosure in the rear um, and the septic's located in the rear. The site's supplied by individual well, individual septic. Um, what the applicant is proposing to do with this application is combine the two lots and then do a, um, uh, an indoor uh, climate controlled facility in the back. Um, you can see it toward the back of the parcel. There'll be a new commercial entrance along uh, Route 216, the, um, the, the larger intersection that we're typically used to. We're going from the 24 to the 36 with three lanes. So it'll be a right in, left out, and then a right out. Um, with this layout here, we've we've located um, the building toward the back. It allows a, a full-size tractor trailer to um, go around the site, which also means it can accommodate uh, fire trucks, uh, emergency service vehicles around the site. <clears throat> In doing so, um, since we've made this application, we've done some additional field work on site. So we've gone out and done soil testing uh, in the area of the, of the proposed building and where the retaining wall is. And we found that there's actually some, uh, some fairly good uh, sandy loam material. So what we're gonna do um, in, a, in a further revision is um, we're gonna move that rear retaining wall forward a little bit. Um, so we have a little bit more buffer between the residential component um, toward the east. Um, and I think in talking to the applicant, instead of doing uh, like a vegetative screening buffer, um, maybe do like a terraced uh, uh, grading down to the retaining wall so we can reduce that, that wall height as we pull it away from the property line and then just do a reinforced fence on top for fall prevention. Uh, but the, the, the game is uh, um, to try to move that wall forward, um, give a, a bit of a more of a buffer area between the residential component um, and have a fence on top. I think it's gonna be easier to maintain um, than, than having a larger landscaping up on behind the wall. Um, we obviously received your comment letters. Um, we have had, since we submitted uh, to the board, we had a conversation with DOT in the field. Uh, they reviewed the entrance. We have adequate site distance. Um, we have to get some information to, uh, to Brennan's office regarding turning analysis. Um, but I think the, the, the trip generation that's gonna be um, uh, generated by the site is not gonna tr trigger a traffic study or anything like that. But I think we just need to narrow down some of the turning uh, uh, movements in and out of the site. But we'll obviously coordinate that with with Brennan's office and we'll supply any correspondence that we've had with DOT with his office so we're all on the same page. But um, some of the conversations that came up in that DOT meeting is, is um, in our proposal that we submitted to the board is we had a, a two-way entrance um, off of our new entrance into the existing front parking lot uh, of the retail building. So the, the thought was is let's try to avoid uh, conflict at that, that new entrance location and take that two-way into the existing retail, let's let's have that be curbed, and then maybe uh, gain two more parking spaces in the, in the front, and we can relocate some of the parking that we need uh, toward the back. Um, but that's something we'll coordinate with your office. Um, but those were the general topics of conversation uh, in the field with DOT. They seem amenable to the proposal, um, and we'll, we'll take it from there with them. Okay. Any questions? Comments. Yeah, the only thing I was at the meeting with DOT, and uh, they did initially, anyway, talk about wanting to have the entrance onto uh, what was that old 52, and I had mentioned I didn't think the planning board would be okay with that idea, you know, due to the impact on those neighbors in that area. That 216 made the most sense, so I think by them curving that other entrance, I think DOT, you know, is on board with, with this new entrance on 216. But we may need to support that with a letter, you know, for DOT. Got it. Okay. 
project any future plans for additional development at the site at this time there's there's no future development um, what we try to do is, is just locate the development toward the back um, of the property and um, at the time the applicant has no intention of, of further developing the site I, 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 well, I think there was some be, discussion about well, I that. think just I think just to be clear I think any development on that corner may hinge upon you know utilities coming into that area so right I think Brian's right at this point because there are no utilities I don't believe they have plans but I think if the utilities come I think they'll be back right. okay we have two actions to take tonight one is to declare intent to be lead agency could I have a motion for that so moved second I have a motion a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Any Before opposed? you schedule, I just want to make sure, Brian, are you going to be able to revise everything that needs to be revised by the October so we can get the plans in for the public hearing? Okay. Okay, so October 12th will work. So yes, the sir. second action that we'll take is to schedule a public hearing for October 12th, 2021. Could I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We'll have, we'll have elevation. We receive elevations yet? Yeah, I actually have them. I can show them right now. Mm, great. Yeah, we did a preliminary sketch layout um, uh, of some elevations and some color renderings, uh, subject to we modification. We need that for a public hearing for sure. Yep. So. Yeah. Great. At this point, do we do we coordinate with AR? I forgot the process with ARB. Do we make applications to them too in yep. in concert? Okay. Yep. So actually, you should actually refer to the ARB if we haven't Good done that already. I can't remember if we did that last time. So let's let's go ahead and do that. I'll accept a motion to refer this applicant to the ARC. So, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. Okay. I appreciate. Thank, it. thank you very much. We'll thank see you, you in October. Okay. The. Next item on the agenda is I Park Buildings A, B, and C. Is there anyone here for the applicant? If not, uh, Michelle, could you just give us a little summary sure. of where you've been with discussions? Sure. So, um, so the last time they were in front of us, um, they had they had submitted a plan with three warehouse. Well two warehouse buildings and one studio with back lots. And the application had been sort of combined into one, um, one site plan and then one EAF. And we felt that they may want to separate the applications but do a, a cumulative seeker review. So in other words, they're gonna separate the EAF, separate the applications so that they, all, they are not all hinged on one another but they will refer to the traffic, the traffic studies being done cumulatively so they'll all refer to the same traffic study and anywhere there may be cumulative impacts will be discussed um, as a cumulative impact in the seeker. So tonight we're just basically gonna take the step to declare our intent to be lead agency for that seeker review and we'll do it three times because we'll separate it into three separate applications. Any questions before we take some motions to declare lead intent to be lead agency? If not, then I'll accept a motion to declare intent to be lead agency for the amended site plan approval for I Park 84 development parcel A. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the next one is uh, Motion to declare intent to be lead agency for amended site plan approval for I-Park 84 development parcel B. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And the last is uh, motion to declare intent to be lead agency for amended site plan approval for I-Park 84 development parcel C. So moved. Second. And all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Excellent. Uh, the last item on the agenda is Project Niagara, the Frito Lay project. Good evening. Good evening. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Gray. I'm with the law firm of Keenan Bean, uh, and I'm representing tonight rolling Frito Lay Sales LP, uh, which is a subsidiary of PepsiCo. Uh, we're here in support of their application for, a cons for the construction of a 150,000 square foot fulfillment center um, at the former IBM East campus, now known as iPark 84. Um, I'm here tonight with Devesh Patel and Stephanie Hanger from uh, Frito Lay. Also, our consulting uh, professional design team, CHA, is here in attendance tonight. Um, uh, I'll go through a, a sort of a treetop summary of the project. Uh, and then uh, a couple of housekeeping items, and then I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to uh, Devesh to go through um, some PowerPoint slides that we've present that we've prepared uh, to familiarize you with the project, uh, and then CHA is going to go through some of the engineering items as well. Um, so first of all, the applicant is very excited to to join the East Fishkill community and looks forward to bringing good jobs and, and tax revenue. Uh, to the town by revitalizing this uh, vacant portion of the I Park campus. Um, we're very familiar with the town's efforts over the last several years um, to amend zoning at the former IBM campus to help facilitate its redevelopment. And I think a lot of the recent applications that you've seen over the past couple years um, have been a testament to that. You've had Amazon, you've, you have movie studios, a brewery, now Frito-Lay. So um, the work that the town put in um, over the past couple years is, is, it seems to be paying off and it is, is doing its job. Um, so the location of the site, it's um, the parking lot basically that you see um, uh, along the south side of Route 52 uh, between gates one and two um, at, on the iPark campus. Um, you will probably recall it as lot two and lot three from the 2017 Global Foundries subdivision uh, when they came in and broke up that whole east campus into several lots. So what we're doing is we're taking a portion of lot two and a portion of lot three and merging them together to create a 28.4 acre lot. And Frito-Lay is currently the contract vendee uh, for that property with iPark. Um, so as I mentioned, the, pro the project involves the construction of a 150 thousand square foot fulfillment center. That's one of three structures that we're proposing. There's also a, um, a small guard house that is proposed for the entrance of the site. It'll be a controlled um, access to the site um, and also an ancillary fleet center. Um, the fulfillment center will have in it uh, what's called an automated storage and retrieval system, an ASRS. Uh, which is a tall piece <clears throat> of automated machinery, and it's used to optimize the storage and retrieval of the goods that they are um, storing at the facility, uh, most often used in a, a high bay warehouse um, environment. So it allows for the efficient use of the space by storing goods vertically versus taking up more of a uh, footprint on the land. Um, while most of the fulfillment center is designed to be about 50 feet in height, uh, well below the 80-foot threshold um, in this district. Um, the portion of the building where the ASRS is located, and it's about 25% of the building uh, footprint, um, that necessarily needs to be higher than 50% to house the machinery. Um, when we submitted the application a couple weeks ago, that taller portion of the building was proposed to be about 85 feet. Um, so we were seeking a waiver from the town board for that extra five feet, going from 80 to 85 feet. However, the good news <laughs> is that we've sharpened our pencils, um, gone back to the drawing board, so to speak, and uh, Frito-Lay has been able to reduce that, um, that ASRS um, height of the, the building to be zoning compliant. We're below the 80 feet now, um, and our next submission will reflect that in the plans. Um, now, the fleet center that I mentioned, um, that is a, an ancillary portion of the site. It's, it'll be a separate structure um, along West Drive, along that side of the property, um, and it will provide service and maintenance for the vehicles that transport the, the goods to and from the facility. Um, the approvals that we need, we obviously need site plan and subdivision approval um, from your board. We're also seeking an economic redevelopment special permit from the town board. Um, as you mentioned, there, there is scheduled a joint public hearing um, on, on September 23rd. Um, we are looking forward to that. 
Uh, for secret purposes, it is a type one action. Uh, we did circulate, uh, notice of intent was circulated. It was authorized by the town board a couple weeks ago. That circulation has happened. If you haven't received it yet, you will shortly. Um, our um, circulation included the full EAF along with about 400 some odd pages of appendices that includes a traffic study, a noise study, um, information on a uh, small pocket of wetlands on the site, uh, which were not disturbing, um, endangered species study. Um, so you'll have, there's a lot of, of backup information in that circulation. Um, I wanna also mention we did receive recently a memo from CPL uh, from Pizza Taro's office. We, um, it's under review by the team, but at first glance, th there don't seem to be any comments uh, that, that can't be addressed, um, and we are working to address those uh, for the next submission. We are also actively coordinating with other outside agencies as well. We had a meeting with um, Dutchess County Department of Health, we're working to schedule meetings with Dutchess County Water and Wastewater Authority. Uh, there were discussions with DOT as early as this morning. Um, so we are actively engaged in seeking comments from outside agencies as well, so we can accommodate all of the comments, including yours, as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Um, so with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Devesh. He's gonna walk through um, some of the uh, slides and then he'll turn it over to uh, CHA to, to walk through the remainder of the slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Devesh Patel. I'm an employee of PepsiCo, specifically the engineering manager uh, for Frito-Lay that has oversight over this project. As Jennifer mentioned, uh, as an organization, we are very excited to be here tonight to present our application to the planning board. We have spent many months uh, trying to find the next home for our fulfillment center. We are excited about the opportunity to potentially bring it here to the town of East Fishkill and be a member of this community. Uh, tonight, I wanted to walk you through a couple of um, slides to give you an overview of our project. And then, as Jennifer mentioned, CHA, our engineering firm, will go into a little bit more detail uh, surrounding the utilities, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the proposed layout. Um, we'll go over some of the zoning compliance per the, uh, the permit. We'll talk about some side access to traffic study and then the utilities uh, we discussed earlier. So just to kind of highlight some of the things that Jennifer mentioned earlier, um, the fulfillment center itself, it's about 140,000 uh, square feet. The complete uh, square footage to include the other ancillary building is 157,000 square feet. From a height perspective, we do vary from around 50 feet all the way up to 79 feet. Uh, as she mentioned, we do do some further due diligence here recently uh, based on feedback from the town and others uh, to, to bring that within the uh, within compliance of the zoning uh, guidelines. From a shipping and dock door perspective, we were looking at 20 uh, loading docks. From a parking perspective, 108 parking spaces is the current ask, 100 tractor trailer parking spaces, and then 13 tractor parking spaces. So I come before you as a, an employee of Frito-Lay However, at this facility, there will be no manufacturing on site. Uh, once again, this is just simply a fulfillment center. So with that, there is no processing, no uh, you know, waste, uh, raw materials, things of that nature that will be coming in or out of the facility. It's strictly the distribution of goods throughout the, the Northeast region. What you see here is a site overview in current state. So today on the agenda, we talked previously about the I Park uh, building A, B, and C, and I believe that that team has been before you uh, in the, within the past two, three weeks. This is building D that was represented on some of the site plans you may have seen. Um, so we at Frito-Lay have been partnering with I Park to put together these plans for the last couple months. Uh, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, majority of our uh, building will be on an existing parking lot. The total uh, acreage is 28.4 acres. Uh, our uh, the disturbed area will be about 20 acres or so. So when we looked at the site plan overall, our uh, intent was to not impact or impact as much as little as possible in terms of previously disturbed areas, and thus most of our building footprint was is situated on the existing parking lot. The exterior uh, landscaping to include the trees along Route 52. Uh, along the gate one path, et cetera, have all been kept intact. 
Uh, the only uh, trees, et cetera, that we may disturb are those that will be, have to be, will be affected by grading, et cetera. Um, just a couple more renderings of what it could look like in the future or will look like in the future uh, based off current uh, plans. As you can see, we've kept all the, the trees along Route 52. So this is an aerial view um, looking from 52 in the western direction. Um, you can see the fulfillment center um, laid in there uh, in the middle of the, the parking lot we discussed earlier. The, the existing berm, et cetera, that is currently along 52 will remain as is, and then we'll also add some additional trees from a screening perspective uh, to help shield some of the building. This is an aerial view, once again, from 52, but looking in the eastern uh, direction. Um, here I wanted to highlight the, the fleet center that um, was mentioned earlier. Just to give you a little bit more detail around the fleet center itself, it is a low infrastructure uh, maintenance garage that both provides service to the tractor fleet, but also used to fuel um, the, the trailers coming in and out of the facility. Um, there will be uh, three or four mechanics based there that will be doing that type of activity. There will not be any additional traffic, I'll say, coming in and out. Uh, to that fleet center, it is local, all the activity is localized there, and once again, is, is more of a low infra infrastructure um, type um, uh, a building to accommodate some of those tasks. The fulfillment center, uh, as discussed earlier, will primary use is to uh, ship and receive goods uh, to the surrounding area, and then we have an office uh, complex uh, attached to the building as well. From an overall proposed layout perspective, this is a, a 2D, uh, depiction, as you can see, uh, through the through the various shades of green, we are, are adding some landscaping to the uh, existing layout. Uh, we are not looking to uh, add um, any acreage from an impervious uh, perspective as we look at stormwater and things like that. We'll get into some of that here uh, in the future slides. But um, uh, overall, like I said, it's uh, it would be about 28 acres uh, that we're looking to uh, uh, develop on at this time. One of, the, one of the key things as well is we will not be in, uh, impacting any of the wetlands, uh, natural resources, uh, any of the species, uh, things of that matter, uh, that are on the property uh, today, which is a, another bonus. From a zoning compliance perspective, uh, we, we did uh, take into consideration the front, the rear, and the side uh, setbacks. So you can see there from the yellow outline how we are in compliance um, with that as we've laid out our fulfillment center and our fleet center. This is a, the zoning and compliance um, uh, overall chart. As you can see, we are in compliance with all the various metrics outlined. Um, just to just kind of highlight a couple of them. Um, we've already talked about the overall height um, itself staying within the, the 80 foot um, uh, requirement. Uh, we have our, the maximum lot coverage currently at 59%, and then the building coverage around 12.69. Uh, so um, overall, no we are in compliance of, of all the uh, asks at this time. I will highlight that this area is uh, classified as light industrial from a zoning perspective. Um, this was the former uh, parking lot for um, the former IBM uh, team there uh, years ago. From a site access perspective, um, the employees and, and tractors, trailers, will be coming off of I-84, uh, come down uh, I Park Boulevard uh, currently. Uh, with our current site plan, the tractor trailers will take a left onto uh, Shandona Road, uh, going through gate three. And then from there, they will take a right and come up uh, that path and they're in, onto the property. From, for automobiles and uh, personnel, uh, currently, we are, look, we are looking to come off of uh, Route 52 and through the gate two, as shown there. We are aware of some discussions that are ongoing as, as recently as this morning uh, with various uh, uh, members uh, to perhaps revisit that. We are taking that into consideration um, and uh, we'll vet that further um, in the coming days. Um, but currently based off the application as submitted in current state, uh, this is the current uh, proposal as such. From an overall uh, site access perspective, uh, once again, uh, we wanted to make sure we kept the circulation drive that is currently around the property, uh, a lot of, primarily for emergency access as well, um, should there for, be a need for uh, fire or whomever, the fire department, et cetera, uh, that access is still intact um, in current state. Uh, 
we will also uh, be using that for um, uh, tractor trailer uh, navigation as well throughout the property. From a security perspective, uh, we will have a guardhouse um, at the gate three entrance uh, to monitor who comes in and out of the property. And then we were also planning to have uh, security for the personnel uh, entrance as well to make sure we can truly uh, restrict uh, access uh, on the property. Having said that, uh, should emergency services be required, uh, they will also leverage that same, uh, can leverage that same access point. There's also a gate on the other side, uh, closer to the west drive, that can be utilized as well for emergency access should the need arise. From a traffic uh, impact study perspective, uh, this was hit on a little bit uh, earlier today as well. Uh, we did, we have consulted a, a traffic engineer, uh, coincidentally the same one that the IPARC team has leveraged as well. Um, so back to the cumulative, cumulative study approach and trying to make sure all the future developments that not only IPARC is bringing but also Frito-Lay and others, uh, we have leveraged the, the same uh, a team to uh, vet that data, uh, which is a benefit to all involved. Um, so we have we're pulled, we've looked at data from 2017 forward and we've incremented the traffic volume by 0.5% from 2017 until uh, 2023 currently. Uh, one, the one key fact there is similar to what the IPARC team uh, spoke to you all earlier about a couple of weeks ago, that is pre-COVID data. So should the conditions change uh, one or two years from now, uh, that it does take those things into consideration. Uh, we're also taking in, into consider future future builds such as Project Redtail or Amazon and some of the other developments that are coming to the town of East Fishkill as well. Um, we are aware of the due diligence uh, memorandum that was issued by the traffic engineer team back in November of last year to take into consideration some of the I Park buildings A, B, and C uh, proposals. Um, and we're, we're once again vetting the complete uh, cumulative picture um, as we look at this further. But as I mentioned earlier, we will vet vet this a little bit harder uh, based off some of the feedback received uh, earlier based off discussions with the outside team. Based off our uh, initial analysis, um, you can see some of the numbers there in terms of vehicle trips, truck trips, and passenger car trips. That's based off ITE data, um, 150 at this time. So you can see kind of overall, we do believe there'll be minimal impact uh, to the uh, traffic um, <coughs> around the site itself. Uh, coming off of uh, uh, I-Park Boulevard um, during the peak times as defined by 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. and also 4.45 to 5.45 p.m. Specifically for the site itself and how what the employee breakout will be, the fulfillment center will operate primarily in the evening. Um, so you can see our shifts, that, or we have two shifts of operation, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. and also 4 a.m. to 12 p.m. And so we currently estimate 30, about 36 people uh, per shift. And so you can see the breakout there. Our peak time uh, for free to lay will be around 4 a.m. And that is where the sh shift exchange, if you will, will occur. And so that's where majority of the traffic in and out from the site um, will occur based off of our operating schedule from a business perspective. We do have some uh, uh, people at around 8 o'clock eight people uh, during uh, what we call the, the morning or the day shift. And that's mainly administrative staff that will help support the business um, at that time. All in all, we're looking to bring about 80 full-time jobs um, to uh, the town of East Fishkill. And you can kind of see the breakup there um, as shown. From a parking perspective, to accommodate um, our employees, you see the, the breakdown of uh, what that looks like from a fulfillment center of 90 parking spaces, five of which will be for ADA purposes. The fleet center, uh, which is on the far left uh, of the drawing there on the bottom, will have 16 uh, parking spaces, uh, two for ADA, and then finally two parking spaces for the guardhouse employees. So as you sum all that up, 108 total uh, auto parking spaces. So we believe we are conservative in that approach. Uh, once again, 72 will be the max at shift chain. So no concerns there about uh, parking uh, needs going forward or any sort of overflow in our opinion. From a trailer parking space perspective, uh, we are looking at 100 uh, parking spots there uh, once again, and then from a tractor perspective, 13 parking spots. Having said that, I will turn it over now to CHA to go through some of the uh, utility uh, analysis. Chris, good 
Good evening. I'm Ron Frears from CHA. And I'm just trying to take you through some of the site utilities and the information that we have for that. Uh, stormwater for the site, we anticipate no increase in impervious area. Um, and the initial stormwater report showing that uh, attenuation, detention, retention is not required. Uh, the existing system that's on site for conveyance will be reutilized. There will be some portions of the existing system that we'll be removing where we need to for uh, building and, and areas where we do need to remove some of the existing system. Uh, we'll be putting in some new storm system tying into the existing that's there. Uh, discharge points from the site will remain where they are now uh, without an increase in, in pre-development runoff at those discharge locations. Uh, we anticipate using uh, stormwater treatment units to treat water quality leaving the site, which at the time that the storm system that's there was developed wouldn't have been required by the stormwater regulations, but uh, treatment of water quality would be required now, so the intent is to use uh, treatment units at the discharge points leaving the site to treat the water quality. Next slide. Yeah, so here you can kind of see the, the general site layout. Um, red being the new stormwater infrastructure lines, the darker blue being the existing lines and kind of where we're tying in there with water quality treatment units being at the, the ends of the existing lines where we're gonna be tying into the outfall locations. Sanitary sewer, uh, there is no sanitary sewer on the site right now and the intent is that we would uh, provide sanitary sewer in three locations at the guardhouse, uh, the main fulfillment center, and the fleet center, and that those lines would come together and go to a point at the southwest side of the site, tying into the existing system that discharges to the existing park treatment plant. Uh, estimated load of 883 gallons per day. The fleet center will have an oil water separator at the discharge point to treat the truck maintenance bay wash water prior to exiting to the sanitary system. And again, uh, the, the intent is to use the existing business park treatment plant. Um, currently, the plants have three lift stations shown to get it to the final discharge point in connection to the uh, existing system that leaves the site in the southwest corner of the site. We may uh, be able to reduce that to uh, two, I believe. Uh, at, a, at, a, at, at least, um, we're gonna take a little bit more look at that, but you can see the general configuration uh, coming over from the guardhouse. The guardhouse is kind of down in elevation quite a bit from the main fulfillment center, so that would definitely uh, be pumped over at least to the main fulfillment center area, and I believe it may be able to go gravity with a portion of that line going through our site, um, and then connecting down to the southwest. So that's the intent with, with sanitary. Next slide. Um, domestic water, there's an existing 20 inch line going through the site and we're planning to relocate a portion of that 20 inch line on the north side of the building. So where you kind of see the line 45 and up and around the fulfillment center would be a, the relocated portion of the existing 20 inch water line. Um, and so from that, 20 inch line that's on site for domestic, we'd be pulling a line off for the fleet center, uh, a line off for the fulfillment center, which you can see it's kind of going into the office portion of the fulfillment center, uh, which is the small building on the east side of the fulfillment center. And then a, <clears throat> a line also coming off the, for the service for the guardhouse, which does have a bathroom. For fire protection water, there's an existing um, fire protection line on the south side of the site, uh, part of the business park, so we plan on doing a loop around the building. Uh, it's a 10 inch loop that will go around the building for fire protection with service into the fulfillment center. And the plans show the detail on the hydrants. I believe there's um, five hydrants located around the, around the building off the fire protection loop. That's for fire water. There is a well water line on site that we will not be impacting or using. So just 
noting that that is on site, but we're not impacting or using the well water line. Uh, natural gas is available to the project site and uh, is estimated to come off of 52 down um, into the site serving the fulfillment center and the fleet center. Next slide. Uh, electrical currently, uh, we're working with Central Hudson Gas and Electric on that. Uh, the preliminary routing is shown from Route 52. I think uh, we may have some discussion with the business park on potentially coming directly from business park sources, but I think that's that's still to be determined. The current plans we have now are coming off of 52, and then distribution throughout the site to the to the three buildings we have on site. Uh, for the sound study, I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment more on this. I can. Uh, I don't have a lot of background with the sound study. If you want to take that one. So we did conduct a, a sound study um, here recently with the three three markers as shown on the drawing to understand the impact, um, specifically uh, from the uh, tractor trailers and also the uh, HVAC units that would be uh, in the facility. Uh, based off our uh, data and research, we would have, uh, we are in compliance uh, with the current noise uh, ordinance uh, limits uh, of 17 EBA and also the limits and guidance provided by the DEC. You can kind of see there are some of the me methodology that we used uh, to determine to uh, evaluate that being cognizant of uh, the residents on Route 52, uh, you know, MP1 trying to make sure John Jay was not impacted, uh, et cetera. So, uh, but we feel confident that that will have minimal impact uh, to the surrounding areas at this time. Once again, as a as conclusion from that, as you can see, uh, the, the data. Uh, there, it ranges from one to, to three uh, DBA at those three source points. Thank you. Yeah, so the landscaping um, around the building, the darker green areas you can see around the building are, will be additional landscaping than what is on site now as impervious. The lighter green is areas that are existing landscaping to remain that we will not be impacted. So, you know, the, the big takeaway is all the screening that's there along 52 will remain and additional screening will be added along the 52 corridor. So, um, you know, the landscaping will, there is a fair amount of screening there now and will be enhanced with new landscaping. But, you know, some of the large areas there and the topography towards 52, I think, you know, kind of lends itself to the natural screening that's that's there already for the project. Um, there are some existing islands in the parking lot that will be removed. Uh, site lighting plan, this is a um, kind of a drawing that was generated by our electrical engineers that they will be using LED lights. The lights will be a full cutoff light. They will be dark sky compliant. Um, site lighting will feature know, visors and fixtures around the perimeter of the property. Additionally, um, the fixtures will be, you know, made to protect neighboring properties from light trespass. So that's a, the big takeaway here, I guess. And they will be photo cell controlled to limit the hours that they are active. So we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, we understand this was a lot of information <laughs> um, uh, to, to absorb. Um, uh, we do anticipate making a supplemental submission, obviously, to respond to comments that we've already received from CPL and any forthcoming comments from, from Michelle uh, Robbins and from your traffic engineers. Uh, but if there's any questions or comments that we can address from the board, we're, we're happy to, to uh, try to answer those questions for you tonight. What was the thought behind no, no signal at gate two? If you behind no able. signal on gate two? Right. Um, the, the traffic study that was performed by AKRF uh, revealed that the, it, the uh, level of traffic coming into gate two would not meet the traffic warrants 
for um, New York State DOT uh, to signalize that intersection. Yeah, I'm just trying, I'm thinking of somebody trying to go out and make a left on the 52 out of, out of there going down towards Palin Road that could be an issue depending mm -hmm. on your timing. Right, and gate two is something that we're, we are um, exploring with DOT and with, um, with the town's uh, outside traffic consultants as well. And it, it's an issue that, <coughs> that we did discuss with AKRF uh, in terms of you know, the, w what the proposed operation <coughs> of gate two would be. Um, it is, you know, it was originally signalized. The signal's been uh, bagged for an awfully long time. The configuration of that intersection is, you know, there is no left left turn lane on 52 to enter the site. So it's, it's uh, you know, I think the DOT is going to have a big say in, uh, you know, what's going to be allowed there based on the traffic. I think that the traffic generation that's currently on the table isn't going to rise to the level of meeting the warrants for signalization. Uh, the DOT. And, and, and I think the town too wouldn't necessarily want another signal in between, you know, Palin Road and uh, and Lime Kiln, anyway. Uh, but <coughs> I think, uh, you know, that that's that. You know, we did talk today about the operation of, of Gate Two. I think one of the questions that uh, you know, and thank you for the presentation. And I have a, a much uh, better and more thorough understanding of the project and and how it functions. Um, but I, I know the you know the only other access into the site externally. I think the uh, the connections to uh, West Drive are actually emergency exit uh, entr or access, right? It's, it's gated. Yes, that uh, is the closed. intent to I mean, have it's it not, gated. It's not, it's not yeah. automated gated. Uh, and then the only other access would be where you in intend to uh, bring the, the trucks through. Uh, and I think the question that, that I would have is that is that access limited to the trucks or, or, or is that also available for the employees to enter there also? I believe that is available for employees as well. Um, I think the uh, intent is that the majority of the employee traffic would utilize the Route 52 uh, Gate 2. Um, but my understanding is that you know, the, the employees would not be turned away <laughs> if okay. they were to utilize Gate 3. I and mean, I think the, the, the issue that's going to come up with the DOT is that you know, from, from, uh, from their traffic generation, you know, uh, similar to, to Redtail, I mean, they anticipate majority of their traffic coming from the I-84 corridor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if, if their employees or any visitors they may have are coming from 84, uh, having to go all the way up to 52 to, to uh, enter the site and, and make a left-hand turn into the site, I think that's, that's going to be the issue that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to, dem if, if that's the operation that they intend to go forward with, they're going to have to make, you know, demonstrate to the DOT that that's, that, that, that's going to function properly. Um, so I think that's, if they can get into, uh, you know, if they can go in uh, at um, Iron Park Drive or Gate 5 at South, South Drive, but whatever uh, has multiple names, I know, um, you know, then, then, you know, they can have direct access north, uh, you know, I into their facility, um, you know, up closer to, to Gate 3. Um, certainly the trucks using and utilizing Gate 3, that intersection is signalized, has a long uh, storage left turn lane there, uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's situated and adequate for tractor trailer traffic, so that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, uh, w you know, once you enter the, the complex, it's in close proximity to their site. So g gate three is gonna be shut down from public access then, and it'll just be for your employees and your trucks? No, gate three would remain as it is today. Um, gate three is not part of the parcel uh, that, that Frito-Lay is acquiring. Mm -hmm. um, gate two, uh, which is the one uh, yeah, to the right, the yeah, yeah, along there, 52. Yeah. That, um, if it's um, approved as proposed, uh, then that would be closed for public access. That would be for employees only. If there were the, the errant, you know, uh, public vehicle that, that were to come in there, they would be directed to, you know, turn around at the, at the guardhouse um, and exit back onto 52, or just continue on down, um, what is that, East, East Drive. I, mean, I was just making sure because I know some people you cut across from Shenandoah Road to get into there and then make the left down towards Sloop and all the other stuff. They're, they'll still be allowed to do they that. Will still, okay. Yep, that will still be open access, okay. absolutely. So, so a couple other little questions that, that, that I would have uh, for, your, for your team is, uh, is, is there, uh, do, does uh, Frito-Lay have any other facilities of this type, uh, you know, any, uh, or anywhere else in the country or in, in New York uh, for that matter? 
I will let Devesh handle okay. that. So we have, this will be the 16th fulfillment center, similar to this in the United 16th? States. 16th, okay. similar to, to this one we were proposing today. Uh, the closest ones to here, there's one in Killingly, Connecticut, and there's, there's one in Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, this is considerably smaller, I would say, than those facilities. Um, those facilities are also attached to manufacturing facilities where this is standalone um, in that. Okay. Area. So, and then I think I understand the operation of this. I mean, you're, you're just going to bring product here and then sort of uh, repackage it and distribute it again. Not, not package it. I mean, you know, re Correct. It'll, sort it. And it'll come in from other manufacturing sites yeah. and then get uh, 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 palletized and then shipped out. Okay. Correct. Is, is there is there any available uh, you know data or traffic data from those other sites uh, that could be uh, looked at to, to help uh, us and also uh, you know the, the, the DOT when when they get involved with the project to you know understand the traffic generation for this facility because it, it it you know it, it kind of falls uh, in between several of uh, sort of the ITE codes and I'm not sure it fits in any of them perfectly and, and you know many developments fall into that category not unique in that, in that standpoint. Um, if there is any data or any other information that can be provided in terms of like frequency of, 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 of trucks uh, arriving and departing, because um, you, know, the, the, you know, I'm not sure that the data that's derived from, uh, you know, from, from the manual uh, you know, does, does that aspect of it justice. I mean, I, I would presume the idea is to move as much material as possible uh, right, and uh, so it, it's, uh, I think, um, if there's any data that can be provided uh, that would be helpful in, in, in being able to come to, uh, uh, you know, uh, efficient conclusions. Um, I, I, so I do understand the shifts. Uh, you know, a lot of times I, I will uh, forewarn you that the DOT likes to look at, uh, you know, sort of worst case scenarios. And so your worst case scenario is when you have your shift change. Uh, so that, you know, they might want you to look at traffic during that shift change, even at the peak hour because uh, you know that's fairly typical you did mention that during the f uh, the eight to five shift eight employees now the, the fleet the fleet center mm -hmm. uh, there's 16 parking spaces there I'm assuming that those are for employees so is that something separate and different where those are for the drivers of the tractors the drivers of the tractors right okay um, but uh, how about the operation of that fleet center I mean th how many so people it's, sorry tr sorry it's a combination of both okay the drivers and the administrative staff in the, uh, fleet but for, the well. for the whole facility including the fleet center you'd only anticipate eight employees I guess that's what I'm asking at a time period of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. that is our current estimate yes so that means there's only like a couple people in that big so. We have uh, shift supervisors, if you will, and then you know senior managers, and then we'll have a couple in the fleet center as well. But we can we can further look at that again to make sure that's that's an accurate number. Okay. Oh yeah, and again, based on you know uh, your other facilities, if there's any uh, you know more specific information information that can be shared in that regard, I, I think that would be helpful. Um, and I think uh, you know just uh, in terms of uh, gate two. Uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I think uh, the signal would be a very, very hard sell. Uh, and, I, you know, th there might also be, you know, the DOT might look to, uh, you know, restrict it. You know, maybe one plausible scenario would be to, to allow right turns in and right turns out. Um, and, and those what, what would be about the a, What about a roundabout? <laughs> 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 the, uh, um, the, uh, <coughs> I like roundabouts, but. Uh, <laughs> um, I knew that. <laughs> But I think uh, you know that that might be a scenario that can be looked at. Uh, you know, as long as you can accomplish uh, you know your other objectives with getting your employees in and out uh, effectively. Uh, and I, as I said, I think if if they're able to get in through that, uh, you know, get in the same way or through an auxiliary access uh, where the trucks are coming in, I think that uh, you know that's how majority of uh, of the people utilizing uh, you know majority of your employees would get there anyway because uh, they'd be coming up the 84 corridor. I, I, I like to come in and using gate three because I was worried about all the trucks <coughs> going past what's going to be, you know, down by the art center and all the food places there. If there's right. the trucks going through while people are trying to use that. I'm wondering a little bit about gate four, which I know is, is, I guess, is locked now, but that's like halfway down the I Park Boulevard between three and five <coughs> there. It doesn't have a getting across 
the divided highway there, but there, there is an you know, entrance exit heading from a certain direction there. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't think that even use has been proposed even in the other, uh, you know, I park scenarios. Mm. Um, uh, that one, I'm trying to remember now, I, I think that one is signalized, but again, it, I don't think it has turn lanes. Right. Right, so it, it, it was uh, well, more. I, I, I think that they built the, uh, the guardrail right through. I don't think you can make a left into right. that anymore. Yeah. But, uh, okay, right. There's, there's certainly, you know, a, a right in and a right out from there heading down towards 84. Right. made a statement that at the AM peak hour, there's no traffic impact. And through our analysis of Amazon and other projects in that corridor, we know we have that, that AM po uh, problem at the school. Uh, so even, even one additional car exacerbates that. But uh, we do, the town does have a plan in place. Right. Uh, which you know, I think a project like this will benefit from. Uh, but I don't want to just say there's no impact. I mean, we right. have a plan to, to mitigate it, but Sure. Even one car at the AM further exacerbates a difficult situation uh, with the school. Right. And what's, what Scott's alluding to is that there's been, you know, a historical issue with traffic at John Jay High School. And, uh, you know, when, when student drop-offs happen and the bus come, there's an influx, a very heavy influx of traffic in a very short period of time. Um, you know, the, the town has, uh, is progressing projects right now. One is to actually construct a, a roundabout at uh, Auditorium Drive and Route 52. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, then create a public road uh, along Auditorium and out South Drive out to Limekill, which then would create, a, a, you know, a, a, a bypass for some of that traffic that is headed to 84. And they would, they would avoid uh, Gate 1 and all the way down Limekill. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the mitigation that's currently being uh, developed and progressed by the town uh, in conjunction with, you know, these, these developments that are happening. As a, as a point of reference, our startup is currently projected to be 2024, assuming construction would start next year based off uh, town approval. So with construction, where will the equipment and materials be brought into the site? Is it, are they gonna use the entrance off of Lime Kiln? What's the proposal there or the thought? The current thought it would come in through gate three okay. and then come up. Um, so. Go down uh, I Park Boulevard, take a left on the Shindoa, and then go up through Gate Three. Would any of the potential development here affect the public's accessibility around the site to access the public areas that we now have available to us to go to? Are you referring to in the southern part of the property? Just in general, like Sloop, you know, all the different spots. No, we would not be impacting uh, those, those spots. And I think if you if you look at the you know the overall layout of it right now, um, you know East Drive connects into North Drive, which then circles back around and connects into West Drive. So I mean that loop does get does get interrupted. Yeah, that's but, what I was going to okay, say. Okay, right. But, but access to those areas, uh, and and you know and how they're accessed. I mean certainly Gate One is a primary, uh, and Palin Road and, and West Drive is a primary access. And uh, you know, and, and then uh, Gate Five at, at South Drive and what's, what's now I Park Drive is also the other primary access. What are all the different kinds of products that you're going to handle at this facility? Is it more than the, the snack foods that I it, associate with Frito Lay? It is strictly the snacks foods at this time. So okay. Doritos, Lay's, uh, Cheetos, et cetera. <laughs> there is no uh, <laughs> beverage product or anything of that nature that'll be okay. coming out of this facility. Thank you. And, and they're going to be using the big tractor trailers, not the smaller, like, you know, bakery trucks that are seen around. The majority of our fleet is 53 foot uh, straight frame trailers. Oh, yeah. Where do they go from here? So there's a, about a four to five hour radius um, outside of um, um, the East Fish Cove that we could potentially go. However, I would say that a lot of our uh, distribution will go to uh, the, the suburbs of the city, if you will. So this is being uh, projected as a strong e-commerce hub for Frito-Lay, just due to the location. 
itself. And so that is one uh, reason why, too, we believe uh, we're excited to potentially come to East Fishkill due to this location uh, close to New York City and the surrounding suburb areas. As, as we all know, e-commerce is, is uh, the, that business market is on the rise and we're looking to uh, leverage uh, locations such as East Fishkill potentially uh, to help drive those. Um, so you're expecting people to like go through Amazon and order a thousand bags of Doritos? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just looking to penetrate different, different markets at this time. Uh, huh. Do we have any other questions? Just one, one more question, I think, for me. Um, the fleet building that you mentioned, I think, did you say there was also a fueling, a fueling station there? Yes, there will be from some fuel pumps there to refuel the, the, the fleet, such that they can make their, their, uh, their next run, if you will. Okay, and then you had mentioned the fire, um, the water surrounded the main building. Is there some other fire suppression or something for the fleet building then? Is that separate, or is that also a water uh, yeah, supplied by water? Right. You have to come up to the podium. Oh, fire suppression for the fleet center. Todd Sorolla with uh, CHA Consulting. The, um, the, the building will be fully sprinklered building, so it's... Uh, the fueling station would be outside the fleet it's building? It's outside. It's a canopy structure. Okay. So there's a structure above it with a canopy. So it is an exterior... Uh, fueling station, yes. Okay. And just to add upon that, I know you have the oil water separator for the uh, bay wash, so I would imagine that will also encompass the fuel filling station as well, right? The oil water separator, the containment system. Yeah, yeah. I'm planning to have the oil water separator for the bay wash, and there's a separate Thousand gallon tank for the fuel currently proposed, and a nine thousand gallon uh, emergency containment. And that'll go through the DEC permitting for that storage and, and fueling stations. That goes through yep. the DEC. Okay, so that'll be another involved agency, I guess, in this. Okay. Okay. If there are just, uh, if you don't mind, excuse me. Uh, 883 gallons a day domestic. Do you know what your non-potable demand is going to be for the car wash or the truck wash? I think the number is included in that. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it said it said domestic in the slide. Yeah. 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 That yeah, that was the total number. That's probably okay. here on our part. But it's about one to two trucks truck washes per day. Okay. What we're estimating, and that's about 550. Uh, gallons per day. So as you look at that 883 number we quoted, the majority of it is coming from the truck wash operation. Okay. okay. The rest of the water is, you know, typical uh, uh, restroom, et cetera, okay. in the facility. Once again, we're not manufacturing any goods here. Uh, so okay. very low water usage overall. Um, I know on that service road, there's what's called the 350 building, and that's where the connection from this site and for the West Campus to the Dutchess County Water and Wastewater Authority uh, borderline is. And in those buildings are the metering, backflow prevention, and I know that needs to be accessible not just from the Global Foundry site, but also from the West Campus as well, and potentially the town in the future. So we'll have to talk about accessing that building, being that you're gating this thing off, because that may need maintenance at any hour of the night, you know, type of yeah. thing. And then the only other thing I'd like to add is any, any meetings that you may have with DOT that HVA, Brendan, or his office is, is invited and involved in those meetings. Yeah, I, I was forwarded an email today um, just based on uh, uh, some correspondence sent to DOT today. So I appreciate that. And if you could uh, make sure that continues to happen. And uh, even, you know, to the aspect of, you know, we can even uh, assist in facilitating uh, coordination in meetings with the DOT. Because there has been a lot of discussions in this corridor over the last year or so. Yes. yes. They want to reinvent the wheel. Yep. Any other questions or comments by board members or professionals? If not, I think the one action that we're required to take is a referral to the ARC. 
Uh, so I'll accept a motion to refer this project to the architectural review. So, so second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. It's So, is there any other business to be brought before the planning board tonight? If not, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the meeting's adjourned.